This is Coaching Club TV and welcome to our April Club Lunch. I have a very special lady here with me today, Linda Aspie. And Linda Aspie is a Time to Think coach, which is part of Nancy Klein's thinking environment. Now, I first saw Linda at an Association for Coaching talk event and this particular approach fascinated me. So I'm very grateful that you're here today with us to tell us a little bit more about this particular approach. And given that you have 25 years of experience in the leadership field, now I have no doubt you've been exposed to a great number of approaches mm -hmm. in both leadership and coaching. Why did you settle on Time to Think? It came about because I first came across the thinking environment when I was reading somebody else's article about it. And it was really intriguing because it talked about creating conditions for people to think. And a lot of my training had been around some of the feelings that people went through because I was originally a trained therapist. Um, and I'd done some cognitive behavioral training, but um, there was something about the way the person described their experience of being listened to, which was a very unique experience. So I wanted to del delve further and then I got hooked. Well, the thinking environment came about through Nancy Klein's work, um, where over many years as a leadership coach and a tutor and a trainer um, and a person involved in education and human development, she came to an observation that the quality of everything we do depends on the quality of the thinking that we do firstly. That sounds fairly common sense, but it does really follow from that is how do we create conditions for people to think well? So the thinking environment looks at what are the conditions that make the difference, that make it possible for someone to think really well for themselves and as themselves. And what are those conditions? Well, we, there are 10 so far. There might be more. One day okay. we might find another. The first is attention. We call it generative attention because when you have somebody's attention listening to you and telling you that what you say is, is important and interesting and that they won't interrupt you, you can think better. You begin to quieten down, you begin to calm down, your thinking seems to take a different energy of itself. So attention to the level that we believe it's generative. We believe that when you get a certain kind of attention, when it's so profoundly good and so seamless and so sustained, that it begins to help us to generate new ideas. To be good at being at having attention, you also need to have ease, which is another component. And when you're with someone and they're easeful, and they're not hurrying you to shut up, or they're not fiddling with their pen, or they're not dying for you to finish what you're saying so they can say what they want to say, you, be you begin to think better and more clearly and more lucidly. Another major idea of the thinking environment is what we call assumptions. We believe that assumptions play a fairly starring role in our lives. We assume good things about ourselves, we assume bad things about ourselves. When our assumptions are true, they're likely to be quite liberating and there could be positive, you know, I can do this, I'm a capable person, I, I haven't come across it before but I know what to do now or I can guess um, or I'm a good person. When they're not true, they are normally very, very crippling. And in a thinking environment, one of the things we can do at certain points in the session is help the client to identify any untrue limiting assumptions they've had and they've been living them as true for a very long time. Um, and help them to liberate themselves from those. And it's those moments when the clients are thinking for themselves and as themselves that they begin to get these breakthroughs. Another component is that of um, information. It's very hard to think well if you don't have the right information. Either if because somebody's withholding information, as can happen in organisations, or perhaps you, you're lacking in some knowledge that you would help you to think well. But a lot of people in coaching tend to think that a lot of coaching is about giving information to help people to think. We don't do that so much. We believe that the human mind can think really, really well for itself and it's best to offer information when it's been invited. What, what are the major differences between some of the more traditional coaching approaches? Okay. And I think you've certainly highlighted a major one. Um, whereas a, t a coach, you feel that you're there to ask that incisive question at the right moment that's going to you know, create an aha moment. But what you're saying is a little bit different. So mm -hmm. just explain a little bit how it differs from the, the more traditional approach. Yes. Specifically related to coaching, what we do do is when uh, the client session starts, we ask them what they would like to think about and what are their thoughts. 
We don't have a pre-agreed agenda unless there's been an objective agreed, in which case we might say, for example, in relation to your 360 feedback, what would you like to think about and what are your thoughts? And when we guarantee someone that we won't interrupt them with a question of any kind, any kind of interruption, they begin to think for themselves and sometimes they think out loud and sometimes they think quietly and they start to unfold their thinking. And it's because it's a totally unique experience to be with somebody who has guaranteed that they won't interrupt you. Just guaranteed. I'm not going to interrupt you until you tell me you'd like a question. When you tell me you'd like a question, the question I'll ask you is, what more do you think or feel or want to say? When someone is listening to you and they are listening specifically with the intention to ignite your thinking and not specifically to respond to it with a question or an observation or an assessment of any kind, then we are able to think much more courageously, boldly, and fearlessly, and creatively. Absolutely. And through that process, people come to the most truly astonishing insights. And that frees you up as a coach to truly listen, mm -hmm. yes. Yes. which is quite a gift for both the coach and the coachee. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It's liberating for both. Because if the coach is concerned about what's the next best question to ask, or that they're worried that they've got to share a little piece of knowledge or information or give the client an aha moment. Um, how can they be easeful? And we know that the mind thinks best in the presence of ease because urgency can destroy. Whilst, yes, you might, might want to get your thinking moving, um, we know you can't have movement in your thinking until you have stillness. Apart from having to change the way you think about your approach to coaching, what has been the greatest challenge in adopting this, this way of being as a coach? Twofold, really, is, is, is that one, that way of being and learning that um, I add value through being with somebody. I add value through my attention. I do not add value through my questions if they're not time to think questions, if they're not encouraging great more thinking. I add value by being present and being interested and fascinated, not just in what the person is saying, but about what they might be about to say next. Because I don't know what they're about to say, and neither do they. No. And if I interrupt them with a question or an observation, or anything, or a frown, or too much of a smile, if I interrupt their thinking, then I will take, the quest I will take their thinking into a different direction than it would have gone without my intervention. So that was the biggest challenge of that. And the second challenge is what clients expect. Sometimes clients, if, you know, they come to coaching and they expect to be challenged, they expect to be um, taught, they expect suggestions, they sometimes expect advice and guidance. And I can do all of that as, as well as the next coach. But who else is going to give my client space to think for themselves, as themselves, if I don't? What would you say is the most frequently asked question that you get sort of top of every coach's mind when they come in and, and hear about this for the first time? Yes. I think the most frequent question is from coaches who say, what if the client doesn't know what they don't know? What if they're missing a vital clue? What if I'm just letting them talk and they're talking and it's hot air? What if they are willfully blind or self-deceptive or in denial? Well, there are two elements to that. One is that, is it really our job to tell people what to think? Um, in fact, there's more than two elements. There's the contract that we have with them. We are, we are here contracted to help you to think for yourself. Um, and if I truly believe that you are in risk of danger or destruction by not knowing something, then I'll maybe stop you and offer it. But if I don't, I'll try and trust the process, in fact I will trust the process, that you will come to your own thinking and it may not be what I would have thought for you. So we always come back to the client's thinking yes. and knowing that they have the answers yeah. already yeah. for themselves. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Or they could generate them. If they don't have them yet, with our attention it's just possible they'll generate them. Now I'm very excited about your upcoming book. Mm. Do you want to tell everybody a little yes, bit about yes. that? Um, well it's in the early stages and I'm just in the first year of writing it really um, and it's called Into the Giant's Shoes 
And of all the leaders that I've worked with over the years, um, a lot of them step into different shoes. They step into new shoes, somebody else's old shoes. They step into dirty shoes, yeah. <laughs> shoes into small clean shoes. shoes, small shoes, famous shoes, um, uh, infamous shoes. And um, it's quite daunting stepping into someone that was seen before as a giant or a role that's seen as a giant. And so what I've been doing is, um, with the marvellous help of some of my coaching clients in the years, is interviewing them and finding out how they manage to step into these shoes and make them their own or throw them out and put their own on instead and, and bring, them, bring themselves, you know, be themselves and be authentic as a leader, be real. And, um, and so I've had some wonderful interviews with some fantastic people. So those are ongoing. Um, and then it's a case then of um, filtering down all these interviews and looking for the common themes so that the book that is then produced isn't just a reminiscing reminiscent it's actually very useful of here are their top tips if they could live their time again this is what they would do again and this is what they might do differently so it's going to be a very practical book for leaders stepping into new shoes big shoes Linda Aspie she is MD and founder of coaching for leaders she is a coach facilitator and consultant and only one of 12 global faculty for Nancy Klein's time to think I'm Tremaine from The Coaching Club and you can find out more about us and upcoming Coaching Club videos on coachingclub.co.uk.